Well, good morning, every. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sarah Kozlowski. I'm Associate uh, Director of the Edith O'Donnell Institute of Art History. And we're here today to welcome Dr. Norman Tennant, who is visiting conservation scientist at the O'Donnell Institute. This past summer, um, I invited Norman to give a presentation on his work for my fall master's seminar on the history of artistic materials and techniques to introduce students to the ways in which uh, conservation science and conservation practice and art history have the potential to intertwine in close study of works of art and artistic materials. Um, this topic is of broader interest to the O'Donnell Institute, of course, so Norman kindly agreed to open the seminar to our faculty and students as well as close colleagues at partner institutions, and I'm, I'm so pleased to see so many of you here. Um, today we'll keep things quite informal. Um, Norman will speak uh, for a time about his work in the field of conservation science and about some past and current projects. We'll then open the floor for questions and discussion. Uh, I know that my students, my seminar students in particular, will be full of, of questions for Norman. Um, so first, I'm honored and delighted to introduce our speaker. Norman Tennant is Professor Emeritus at the University of Amsterdam, and since 2016, he's visiting conservation scientist at the Edith O'Donnell Institute of Art History. After receiving his PhD in chemistry at Glasgow University and a postdoc at Ohio State University, he took up a position at Glasgow Museums and Art Galleries, where he established a new conservation science department. In 2001, he was appointed a chair at the University of Amsterdam and in 2009 became the university's first full professor of conservation science. He is the author of more than 100 scholarly articles, a former editor of, uh, um, of Studies in Conservation, and founding editor of Reviews in Conservation. His research activities include polymer degradation and stability, indoor atmospheric pollution, the technical study and conservation of inorganic materials, and the reevaluation of former conservation treatments. So welcome, Norman, and thank you for joining us. Thank you so very much, uh, Sarah. I, I trust that you can all hear me uh, coming over loud and clear, even though I'm sitting here uh, many miles away from Dallas and Texas in Scotland, my home at the present time. Uh, thank you for that very warm and, a, well, rather overwhelming introduction. Uh, I hope you're not totally exhausted already by all that catalogue of my busyness. And in fact, there'll be more of that to come in this lecture, where, as Sarah has rightly said, I will be giving some examples of projects, but I'll be prefacing, prefacing that um, with a kind of overview to orientate this field of conservation science, although I'll be using and even trying to define somewhat other terms like heritage science, which is coming to the fore today, and I'll be making comparisons with what the notion of conservation science or technical art history, or archaeometry and archaeological science, how these terms all fit into this general study, which one could call, well, either heritage science or just art for science. So there'll be a little bit of that kind of overview. And it, again, in a lot of what I'm saying, there will be a very personal connection to the development of the field and the activities within that field. And I hope you excuse me if I dwell on the research projects that I personally have been involved with, but that will bring me, of course, into connection with EODIA and with uh, UT Dallas, because a couple of those that I'll be mentioning are very much founded and based in the initiatives that uh, have been emerging from EODIA. So without further ado, I think I will um, depart from my sitting room in Scotland and share my screen uh, with you. Hopefully this is going to work. And here goes. If uh, I think I just need to press share and we should be in business in just a moment. Yes, so this indeed reflects what I've just been saying. The next 45 minutes or 50 minutes, I hope I don't go on for too long, 
uh, is an introduction to conservation science and technical art history with examples of current research. And uh, basically, the notion of art and science getting together is a rather magical and productive and inspiring combination. Uh, though, as we'll find out in this um, little overview, the notion of conservation science and all these other fields, which one would be saying are related, is a rather recent development in the sense that they have really only come to the fore post-1945, Second World War, and into the 50s and 60s. We will see more of that in a moment. Um, we hope that the combination is productive and successful, uh, and that the results of the combination are nothing like this cartoon particularly tried to um, uh, show that science and art are not necessarily good bedfellows. Well, this afternoon, uh, well, the morning for most of you, they are going to be very close and warm bedfellows indeed. This constellation of topics around the notion of conservation science gives what I consider to be a rather um, comprehensive view of different fields which are subsets of conservation science. Although if one looks at the top right of this little solar system, technical studies and analysis of cultural property, that sounds like technical art history. But as we'll see in a moment, that also can be relevant to conservation science in its own right. But it's important to think of these studies as being all these things, and of course, in different locations and in different places, specialists and specialist scientists will be putting some of these subjects more or less to the fore. Investigation of the deterioration itself, studies of the environment to see how that affects works of art and uh, art materials. The control of that environment but when it's not success successful and the notion of what are the ideal parameters for display and storage of works of art. And then for actual interventions, for treatments, then of course science comes very much to the fore in the laboratory testing of conservation materials and the methods that one uses to have interventive treatments as opposed to some of the environmental notions of science, which is creating in a passive way, a preventive way, the ideal situation to prevent deterioration. And in all of this, the implementation side involves field trials or museum trials in more strict sense for us to actually scrutinize are the laboratory processes and procedures that are being developed working in practice and as we'll see in one of the examples in particular that I will give of some research are they effective not just in the short term but in the long term as well because span of time is at the bottom of all of this that we are trying to enhance the lifetime of works of art as much as possible within the terms that everything alas ourselves included is deteriorating and our notion is how to slow that and if it has already happened how to return objects into a more stable and also let's face it a more pleasant way to be enjoyed when we visit galleries and museums so with that overview in a constellation like this here's the notion of the term heritage science. I won't go through the whole of that definition. If it's a definition, I'm not sure if it truly is. This was taken from our wonderful Wikipedia. But it seems to my mind, especially in the last sentence, say that heritage science is an umbrella term encompassing all forms of scientific inquiry into human works and the combined works of nature and humans of value to people. So that's a very broad ranging and all encompassing term. And indeed, that's where heritage science, this currently much used term, where now even the 
journals of the field incorporate that ter term on occasion, rather than the subtopics which have been recognized even before the term heritage science became in vogue, which is something like only 20 years ago. Up to that time, conservation science, technical art history, archaeometry, and archaeological science, these were more to the fore. But what are they? Sorry. One moment. Well, here's the definition of conservation science that I would like to start with. And it's very personal because it's one I have just evolved myself. All you see in this slide are my notions of what these terms convey. And a simple one for conservation science and a broader one would be any application of, of an application of any branch of the natural science with the direct motivation to improve conservation restoration of cultural heritage. In other words, science that has a goal, an aim to improve the conservation and restoration, slightly different connotations there, of cultural heritage. Whereas technical art history, in this definition, as I give it, which is trying to separate out these fields, would be the notion of studies, and it's these side type of studies, chemical analysis, imaging, recreation of technologies, in order to understand better the techniques used by artists, or to understand the materials, their sources, their processes, and of course, to take into account the use of that sort of approach in authentication and dating. So the motivation of technical art, art history, as I'm defining it here, is different. It's to support, in a sense, art historical, and uh, perhaps archaeological knowledge more than conservation knowledge. Of course, these are, are sometimes somewhat artificial definitions and not maybe necessary to be too careful about specifying which field one is actually in. But I will delve into that a little more in the sense of trying to tease out which of the three fields and archaeometry, as you see in this approach, is very similar to technical art history. But if we see what the differences of the three fields are, then it will be quite interesting to compare where the flavor of the month is at present. And it seems to me that it's waning from the science of conservation to the science of technical studies for the support of understanding of workshop practices and uh, curatorial and art historical issues. We will see, that might be a point for discussion at the end of the talk. The functions that describe the role of the conservation scientists, well, these were the result of a meeting of many conservation scientists drawn from all over the world some years ago we met in Bologna to assess the field. And this was part of the so-called Bologna do document, a very grandiose term for what we did. But the notions of what the functions are, are well encapsulated here. And I may say that this PowerPoint is going to be uh, recorded, of course, in the seminar and could be made available to anyone uh, in its own right who wants to follow up with any of this uh, information. But it's all these features, and just to pick them up one by one, obviously it's a reflection of the solar system that I delved into a moment ago. But the other aspect of this is that, as well as actually taking account of connecting with the objects, with the materials, with the uh, art objects of museums and galleries, the principles of conservation and the notion of what scientific research into conservation has to be community, communicated as well. And it's to be, to be communicated by the conservation scientists to conservative restorers, 
but also to the outside world. And there we see, and it's a, perhaps an extension that has occurred since this Bologna document, that only this month, this has been published by the American Chemical Society, contextualizing chemistry in art and archaeology. And this is the publication that arises as an online publication um, from a conference where many scientists from universities or colleges presented their ways of how they are introducing science to non-scientists in many cases or to science scientists at university by introducing the science of art and if one is met with, for example, one title from this particular book and one topic from one particular university, then it seems very appealing indeed to non-scientists if they hear a module which is connecting chemistry to cultural heritage, presenting physical sciences and non-science majors to non-science majors and first-year scientists through the investigation of works and art and archaeological artifacts. In other words, non-science majors and first year st students are being introduced to the complexities of science in a very appealing and informative way without the intimidation that science often has for non-science majors. That is going to advance more and more, I'm sure. The field of conservation itself, of course, as I was hinting at a moment ago, it goes back many years to the, even to the 18th century and the 19th century where scientists were involved in studies uh, of art objects. But it's only in the more recent decades that it has come to the fore. And that kind of can be evidenced by the so-called Bible of conservation. This is how you actually treat objects. And this book published in its first edition in 1957, encapsulated in one volume pretty much what was felt to be the main aspects of conservation of all of cultural heritage. 373 pages. That amount of knowledge increased a bit by the second edition. It went to a grand total of 394 pages. But of course, this seems absolutely ludicrous that from the 1950s and then the 19, early 1970s, one book could be seen to in any way represent what is now treated by hundreds of books and specialisms dealing more and more with smaller and smaller topics. So the field of conservation has expanded, and of course, so has the science that goes with it. If one wants to go back to an accumulation of all the technical studies that are published for science of art and archeology, span then this was a forerunner of the present series. This was one volume for the period in question, which is the early period from basically post-war onwards until this new series, Art and Archaeology Technical Abstracts, began to be published. And that is now a series of books which has become an online publication published by the Getty Conservation Institute or the J. Paul Getty Trust in reality, AATR Online, Art and Archaeology Technicals Online, uh, can be uh, accessed through that site. And this shot from my own bookcase actually shows you the range of publications year after year post the public publication that the FIA produced in the last uh, slide. Some 156,000 publications are abstracted in these years of this publication and indexed. And so this is an enormous resource for those involved with the science of art. Every year, some 40,000 abstracts are added to this resource. So there's a huge effort from the days when 
conservation could be encapsulated in one book and conservation science was a very young discipline. So young that when I began my career, which wasn't yesterday, it had to be admitted, that the term conservation science did not really exist. It's post the 1970s. I actually offered a prize. It's still on offer, though nobody really is aware of it these days. But through the International Institute of, on, uh, of Conservation, the major organization supporting conservation, I offered a bottle of a fine malt whiskey for anyone who could tell me the first use of conservation science as a term for the field that really recognized what we now understand by the term. I came up with some answers, but in each case, it was not clear that it was the very first, and nobody actually was, was so confident that they claimed the bottle of whiskey. It's still sitting on my table beside me. It'll be probably better than ever if anyone can actually claim it. But that's interesting that conservation science really did not exist in name, though of course it did exist in practice before the 70s. If we go back to the more general term, embracing these subtopics of technical art history and archaeometry, I thought it was in, would be interesting for a moment to just dwell upon where these sciences are practiced. And I think there's four arenas, nationally or regionally funded centers or privately funded entities. And in the next slide, I'm going to use the United States to illustrate the kind of institutions that represent these four topics. One could perhaps add internationally funded centers, but then I think one only comes up with maybe one or two, and one would be the International Center for Conservation at Rome. Uh, but it's not recognized primarily as a conservation science setting. They're supportive, but not really their prime aim. Museums and galleries, however, are a major setting for conservation science. Universities too, and increasingly, they, it exists within master's degree programs, mainly as teaching, but also as research support for the undergraduates and postgraduates there. There are some dedicated research units, and increasingly, and again, it has really happened within the span of my own career, there are many, many dozens, hundreds even, of one-off research property projects within science faculties where the science faculty member would not call him or herself a conservation scientist, but has the expertise to provide science support for such conservation science projects. Or oh, technical art history, for that matter. And then in a very small category, I think it's fair to say, there are some private commercial enterprises tackling the subject. And in the USA, what, which we will get to in a moment, we'll see that there are quite a number of museums and galleries and lesser numbers of the others. But before we go to the USA, I did reflect upon this and said it will be able to forward to anyone um, who is interested my PDF of this article where I looked at the different ways in which these four situations tackled the subject. Because what happens in a museum and art gallery is very different and should be very different, is my view, from what might happen in a major national or regional center, where more fundamental studies could perhaps take place, as opposed to a museum or gallery where the needs are very much more related to the day-to-day -day necessities of that collection. That's there for further delving into, and maybe we can discuss some of these issues later as well. I'm not going to through, go through this exhaustively, but we see that if it comes to the first category, 
the United States does not have a National Conservation Science Institute. Canada does, the Netherlands does, there are a handful of nations, not the United Kingdom, who have national laboratories. But what the United States has as is a major private enterprise. It's the Getty Trust, whose Getty Conservation Institute provides a major source of conservation science activity within the USA. As on a smaller scale, generally, do all the museums and galleries listed here. I don't claim this to be a totally exhaustive list of what's happening in the USA, but it's rather representative and it certainly gives main centers. If anyone um, sees it at great omission, let's talk about that later. And then the universities, as I say, in different categories, depending on whether they're dealing with collections, perhaps a university collection to its own to their own extent or are tending to provide more a source of knowledge and research of wider world issues in the subject and of course there are the, you know, the education programs which are highlighted here only four prominent ones in the united states with significant conservation science and on the private business side well sotheby's is now dipping its finger into the topic. And in New York, they have their research department. The notion of John Trilly is an interesting one because he represents an individual who is involved, as indeed I have been in my own career, in freelance conservation science research and expertise. But John Trilly also embodies something that's rather interesting and maybe a model where a freelance conservation scientist has actually been appointed, thanks to the Mellon organization, as a science advisor to the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in Kentucky. And that is an interesting concept where the notion of not building up a science laboratory within the museum, but bringing in expertise that is dedicated to that museum is being carried out. But now we come to some examples. And I think it's good to start with a project that, as we'll see in the next slide, is very much UT Dallas based. It's a tripartite project supported by three organizations. We'll talk about that in a second. And the aim is to research glass degradation with two main goals to develop a simple non-invasive analytical protocol to detect which glasses are actually in danger of degrading and possibly being lost for display and study as a, an object with a good integrity because of the degradation process. And in the process, the relevant aspect of that for preserving the life of the object is to establish what the preferred storage and display conditions are for unstable glass. So you can see that this is actually tackling one of the constellation uh, of topics in a practical way for degradation and prevention of degradation. This it gives the scope of the project. And again, it's important here because I think not only does it represent Eodia and University of Texas, but it, it represents a model which is rather unusual, which has indeed, indeed been activated by the conservation science venture at Eodia. And in so doing, has brought in two very significant partners for glass research, the Rijksmuseum Amsterdam, which has both a huge glass collection and an intense scientific laboratory, and the Corning Museum of Glass, which has probably, I think I would say certainly, the best collection of glass in the world, upstate New York. 
And then there are various collaborators, organizations which are not strictly partners for the research in the sense that they're not strictly involved in funding what is a three-year postdoctoral project. And we'll talk about it in a moment. And then there are cooperating institutions mainly providing access to collections and to glass which has degradation problems and of course these are amongst the museums which are interested in the results and the progress of the research along with many others. What are we talking about here as far as the decay of glass? Well this is one example, uh, whiskey glass which as you see is from a recent period, only from the 1980s, late 80s, but nonetheless the surface is covered with a moist film. Here, a similar effect of the degradation, but the surface is covered with crystals covering the whole interior and exterior of that object. And here at the Corning Museum of Glass, a bowl, which should be in that condition, but has gone further in its degradation process from being an intact object to through atmospheric conditions being inappropriate and the glass being unstable has degraded so that the whole object is covered with this hairline network of cracks and is virtually opaque and as a display object is virtually meaningless. That would be the same for an object such as this in the Rijksmuseum. The object should not be pink. That's part of the degradation process. It was clear glass originally. But again, the extent of degradation is so severe, the glass is completely covered with hairline cracks and is in a stage of actual disintegration. And of course, glass is not only an object in its own right, but it could be a co covering of another material as an, an enamel. This is a Limoges enamel, a close up of an area where there's metal and glass corrosion interaction. So this is just a very brief summary. And of course, as I give these illustrations of what is conservation science, it's going to be very rapid and very superficial in a sense, but I hope in each case you get a notion of how current research and this project is still ongoing and we have Chris Farhar with us today in the seminar audience and he is very much involved, as we'll see in a moment, with sorting out the issues of this process and being able to understand how we can identify which we cannot do at the present time, indubitably, what glass in the museum is sensitive to this process of degradation. We should just have a little reminder before we talk about that, uh, very briefly, of what glass is. Here's a lovely um, um, manuscript illustration uh, of a Bohemian glass house. The illustration shows the glass house in operation, but it also shows above the raw materials being collected. And so to understand the degradation of glass, we should just have a little re reflection on what those raw materials are that have been brought together to be melted in the kilns. And basically, glass is essentially sand mixed with a so-called flux which modifies the sand and allows the melting point to be lower than pure sand in itself and that would be soda or potash and that would come from the ash of plants notably trees but could be fern could be um, uh, any kind of um, plant and in, in um, that will give soda or potash ash in my own research, for example, there was good evidence that glass made in Scotland in the Middle Ages was made from Scottish heather. Well, that would be rather nice and uh, I have yet to have anyone challenge the findings that it could have been, but we're not certain. 
the network stabilizer, of course, is very important for this research because it represents the point at which glass becomes not unstable but durable. If the third ad additive, lime, chemically it's added as uh, uh, lime from crushed um, shells or whatever, and these all enter into the melt process and give a material that we recognize as glass. But if the balance of these products is not right, namely the modifier and the stabilizer, then one has inherently got a glass that is destined to be unstable and deteriorate. And it is only a matter of time involving also the environmental conditions in which that will undoubtedly happen. And here at the Corning Museum are two examples where again, there's this misty, slightly opaque, moist film on the surface. And the moist film is occurring through moisture in the air, reacting with the glass and causing chemical deterioration insofar as some of the constituents that made the glass, the ones we just reflected on just now, are leaching out of the glass structure, atom by atom, over many years, and forming a solution on the surface which contains these materials. So the deterioration process leaves a residue on the surface, which is the bottom line for the motivation of this research. How does one find that out if that is happening? And how does one find out if it's going to happen increasingly to a glass that seems to be fairly stable? No signs of deterioration or the beginnings of signs. Is it deteriorating rapidly? Well, the point would be to analyze the glass components that have come out of the glass. And if they're coming out, it is by the definition of the term, an unstable glass. The atmosphere is provoking that deterioration and one should be able to detect the pro products of the glass on the surface. In this case, in the moist film, but in some cases, and this is most interesting for curators and conservators of museums, invisible surfaces. And here is Chris Farhar sampling by our protocol from the surface to get material swabbed from the surface in a very strict protocol, which is then transferred from the cotton swab. It's not actually cotton in this case, uh, but a swab that is not containing any stray materials which would affect the analysis so that we can analyze what is coming out of the glass. Typical of conservation science nowadays, the instrumentation has to be sophisticated and state of the art. And without going into the details, because this is a very rapid survey covering different topics to give a notion of what the topics are, but not the full scientific import of what is involved with the research is a topic called iron chromatography and the and the, uh, the elements that come out of the glass come out in the form of these positive or negative charged ions are deposited in that way and they can be analyzed and give peaks on a chart which is which the size of the peak is related to the amount of material that was initially on the surface of the glass, but has been swabbed off, diluted with water, inserted into this instrumentation, and give such a chart output that gives us the possibility of knowing very, very accurately and with great precision uh, what the elements are. And in this way, we are beginning to be able to determine the amounts on different glasses and compare that with the state of deterioration. And just to give you a notion of how this might be done and how we're beginning to do it, here are results from different objects. Each column is the amount of 
ions that are formed on the surface that were originally part of the glass composition, but through the deterioration project process have been leached out, have been swabbed off, have been analyzed, and we see that all those solid bar charts to the right have high levels, tall columns. All the objects on the left, less so. And it's very satisfying that the designation by conservators of stable or unstable fits precisely with the amount of materials that are obtained. And we're refining this process uh, month by month, object by object, to be able to be more and more clear cut as to where the dividing line is and where one can say with great certainty that this is a deteriorating object to be very careful of. But the bottom line is a stable object will not be leaching out any ions whatsoever. It's the degree of instability that brings in the uncertainty is how unstable is this particular object. But this allows a categorization already by conservators to say we can find a subset of our collection which needs particular care and attention, particular monitoring, particular storage conditions, and that's a definite advance, and that's the result of this tripartite project. Now, alas, in its final stages, but will be forming the basis of new world thoughts on how best to do this. No one else can do this at the moment, other than in those involved in this project, um, to such a degree of specificity. But that will hopefully transform into this being a method widely available and implemented by museums worldwide. Topic number two. I thought it was fair to say, although I count myself strictly as, a, for the most part, a conservation scientist rather than a technical art history scientist, we should have a topic, again from my own research, where it is more technical art history. In other words, to reflect back on what I was saying earlier, the motivation is not to solve a conservation issue. The aim is to use this very long titled technique, laser ablation, inductively coupled plasma, mass spectrometry. Thank goodness it's got an acronym, L-A-I-C-P-M-S. It doesn't matter too much what the technique is called. I will describe a little bit about how it works to give a notion of the kind of useful information that such a technique can give. In this case, the technique is being applied to blue and white ceramic glazes, and it's intended to give more information about the colorant material, a cobalt ore, which has caused the blue design. And its aim is to be able to do that in a way that requires this instrumentation, but it gives a very clear cut relationship between the composition of the ores and the composition of the glaze and the elements that give rise to that particular design. It is a wonderful technique because instantaneously, rather than consecutively, one gets 55 elements from the periodic table to a very low level of concentration. Lower than a percent, lower than a part per million, one can go down ultimately, ideally, much further than that to parts per trillion, to a billion, I should say. Um, trillion is pushing it a little bit. But that's amazing. So one can tell very small amounts of impurities and the potential, therefore, is to find relationships between the ore and the source of the ore, because geological sources of that ore will have different trace and ultra-trace elements, 
And so that could be important in understanding the trade routes, the movement of raw materials around at the time of the manufacture of these particular artifacts. And also for how they influence the different hues of blue that are in the design. Some are more purple, some are more green. That's because of the influence of competing elements. So how does it work? Or at least what does it look like? Here's a blue and white tile. It's a Dutch one. It's a, depict, a fragment thereof. Um, and in this case, one is using this artifact as one can for much study material, where unfortunately this is a technique that actually requires the sample to go into the sample chamber. And that is the chamber where this particular part of this particular tile has been placed as a proof of principle technique to see what happens when one actually analyzes the composition of this blue and white soldier. And we're only going to analyze the head of the soldier, that area there. The owners of this particular artifact um, were very keen to provide it, um, and uh, were, were, it was no problem that the artifact was going to be have to be um, segmented for analysis. Since the owner was me, that was easily done. <laughs> uh, it's nice to have a collection of one's own that one can use for experimental material. So when in this sample chamber, this technique with this rather uh, long-winded name of laser ablation, inductive inductor couple plasma, mass spectrometry. The important thing is there's three things happen. A laser is fired at the surface and it essentially evaporates or volatilizes, as we scientists like to say, the elements from the surface. They get drawn through a flame in a process that leads the vapor from the object through a flame where it atomizes it into an analyzing process, that's the mass spectrometry, which is able to quantify it. That's all you really need to know at the moment. Uh, the material is removed, but only in a way that hardly shows there has been any uh, activity on the surface. It would be difficult to um, it doesn't destroy the object in its own right, like some techniques. But the point about that would be that this is the kind of image when one gets from all these elements. Every rectangle here is a different element. And as you see, some of them have very much the image represented only by the fact that where the blue is, there is that element. And the, the chart is color-coded so that high concentrations are warm colors and low concentrations are cool colors. But you see that the most obvious ones are a pale blue on top of a dark blue. In other words, the dark blue is the absence of that element and the pale blue is the presence of that element. So let's home in on one or two of them. It's a cobalt artifact, um, a cobalt glaze. So obviously the cobalt is the main colorant element. So it's going to be there, but it rather sinks into the surface of the glaze. And so it's not even as prominent as the iron impurity that is also there. And where there is, is cobalt, there is iron. There is a very faint outline of arsenic, AS. So there's a little bit of arsenic in the source material. But then the technique goes even into more unbelievable realms of low detection limits. And we get three elements here, 
where even scientists have to rack their brains to remember what the symbol is. TM is thulium, TB is ter terbium, HO is homium, not nearly as common elements as cobalt, iron, and arsenic, but they're there only where the cobalt is. So they're tiny impurities in the cobalt ore, transferred in the glazing process to the design. So any archeological source, geological source of the ores that have these signature elements would have it transferred into the object in question. And so in that way, one is able to, for example, ideally be able to recognize cobalt ores from Germany, as opposed to those from Pakistan, uh, from um, Persia, as, of those, as opposed to those from Afghanistan, three major sources of cobalt ores for pigments and for glazes and art. I'd like to just briefly talk about identification of polymers. And that is a case of trying to predict where adhesives and replacement materials for missing parts of, well, in this case, ceramics and glass, uh, can be tested to see of their true conservation quality. Are they going to last? Here's an example from a Tiffany glass window in the Corning Museum, which has not lasted well. It's as been applied as a coating, and it's gone from transparent and clear to yellow. Not an ideal conservation material. And we know that now because it's gone wrong. And unfortunately, that's the case in many of the conservation materials that were used in the past. So we can learn from the past and be able to actually identify higher quality materials from their long-term behavior within a gallery or museum. The other, other way to tackle that is to carry out in conservation science laboratories, accelerated aging. In other words, one would promote the long-term behavior in an accelerated laboratory situation, often by strong light or even high temperatures to induce the effects that will happen in many, many years natural aging in weeks or maybe maximum months of an accelerated experiment. But they're unreliable. This is a quote which says that the majority of users not believe that they properly simulate or predict service. So it pays therefore to carry out some research to compare the results of the accelerated aging tests and the same materials in natural use. Do they match? It's a test of how reliable accelerated aging tests would be. And this is the, the research in question here. And this is the uh, first point that the, con the conclusions from long-term behavior of polymers has a disadvantage that often there is no good record of what that particular polymer was, like the yellowing coating on the Tiffany window from Corning. But there's a technique, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. Again, it's not important to know the ins and outs of the technique, but it's a very good technique for analyzing organic materials and identifying, hopefully in this case, particular polymers, types of polymer, or even individual commercial products that were used in the past where there's no documentation of what was used, but where there is the evidence of how it behaved. And alas, this is how another object behaved, where all the areas of glass that were filled have gone orange. Is this a good product or is it not? Well, the trouble is accelerated aging tests carried out by a reputable international laboratory said that this particular product is one of the top recommendations for glass conservation in that it's a very stable polymer that does not yellow. In this case, it seems to have. So what's going on here? Likewise, this particular polymer 
a whole neck of this vase was replaced by casting the neck in an epoxy resin. Both these objects are epoxy resins, but which ones? Well, this is the FDIR, the technique, graph that shows an authentic spectrum, lines on the top half, with an unknown object, the object that was shown in the previous slide. And all that one needs to know about the technique is that these peaks in the black and in the blue are all in the same positions with the same pattern almost identically in both samples. So this technique is allowing a comparison of how the constituents, the molecular constituents of the material are matching. And there's only one particular point I would like to show if my cursor is not lost, seems to have vanished. Yeah, there it goes. And here down at 17, 34, that particular point on the scale here is a little peak that's not present in the original pure material, which is now still available. And that peak is indicative of the yellowing that has taken place in the sample in question. So at long last, we're finding a technique that can actually clearly identify some of the products that were used in the past and enable the understanding of how old repairs are behaving and how that matches with accelerated aging and where an old repair has remained clear for 30 or 40 years, one knows that one doesn't need an accelerated aging test to be able to show that that material is definitely of conservation quality. This is an example of such a material. And in that respect, the discrepancies that I'm describing are very much the notion of how to be able to take the science of inspection by these techniques to the point that current cutting edge science can be used for simple practical questions either through initiating research projects or from continuing to work on particular problems of museums. I could go on all afternoon as you gather with, three, with examples, but I think this is a good point having given three projects which show different aspects of this cultural heritage and uh, um, uh, study with science looking at both conservation problems and technical art history problems. I hope we've got time for some questions. I have gone on rather extensively. Sarah, what, for how can we organize this? Yes, hello, Albert. Thank you, Norman, so much. And just apologies to everyone. It looks like my internet connection is a little bit unstable and it's been um, logging me off periodically. So if I disappear, I will reappear in due time. Um, thank you, Norman, um, for this overview of and this kind of capacious definition of, of conservation science um, and technical art history and archaeological science, um, as well as the kind of institutions and configurations of institutions in which these, um, these fields are practiced, and then specific uh, examples of uh, ongoing research and, and treatment plans for, for objects based on this, this work. Um, let's simply open the field for, for questions. Um, and since we are few, I welcome you to turn on your cameras and mics and, um, and offer your question. <laughs> this has been recorded, hasn't it? So, uh, yes, in yes. fact, so we can, we can um, share it uh, uh, yeah. for those who were not able to, to make it. I wonder if I might start off um, the question. 
uh, our questions and, and discussion by asking, um, you know, in terms of um, research as well as, as practice of, of conservation, what are the, the, um, the next fields or the next subfields that really, really need attention in order um, both to inform uh, art historical research and, um, and uh, conservation practice. And what, what are you seeing in the field right now as, yes, as really it's, right? Yes, it's interesting and a, you know, that's a, 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 an incredibly important question and it's a, interesting to see how it, the answer is being given by different laboratories in different places. The, the important thing about the question is that how are these, how do these questions arise and from whom should they arise? I think from my point of view, all the best topics and the choice of topics come about where it actually is from a combined discussion within the field between conservators, scientists, curators, all talking about their particular issues. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's so many of them that it's a case of the art of the possible sometimes. It may well be that out of a discussion of that sort, with the three parties all taking place, that there are some wonderful things that are desperately needing investigated but maybe science has not quite got to the point of being able to do that properly. In a sense, the um, notion of the projects that I was mentioning is true. It's the technique of iron chromatography for the study of glass. It only became available in the 1970s. That technique did not exist before then. And then it's been refined and uh, so on since then. Um, so that was, if one had wanted to do that kind of study in the 1950s, it would not have been possible. Uh, Fourier transport infra infrared has been around for a long time, not much longer than uh, iron chromatography, but the level of sophistication is now so much greater that one can do it on tiny little samples and on surfaces without even sampling at all. So the possibilities of what can be solved by the techniques. So I, I think there are, to answer your question by not answering it is in a sense that the creation of the topic to be investigated is really dependent on what the potentiality is for solving the topic. And I think in the case of technical art history, that is driven now by uh, immense possibilities for specificity that are provided outside of a museum laboratory with techniques that are, for example, connected to the use of a synchrotron, where there's only a special scientific center that is able to analyze with that amount of specificity, specificity for some specific aspect of a deterioration process or an art historical question where one would actually have to go to the facility to um, analyze or the result. Uh, so it's not really, I'm not really highlighting um, any topics. I should say, maybe just as a personal hobby horse, it is true that of course, for at the forefront of topics, the problems of easel paintings do always come very much to the fore. It's no coincidence that I've focused on the problem of glass and ceramics, because in, in a sense, they are a little bit uh, in the category of the Cinderella's of rather <laughs> neglected subjects. There are maybe a few more. There's also maybe more recent fields of study. And I think one of the ones that I would point out is um, issues to do with fo photographic materials as mm -hmm. being absolutely something that is on the cusp of becoming really a bigger and more important topic and deserves to be so. So it's, it's, you've asked a big question, Sarah, but it's a good one. And I hope that is some aspect of how one would answer it. No, absolutely. I think that's, that's absolutely right, that it's, it's, a, it's, a, 
it's a kind of negotiation between the questions that are being asked and what's possible at that moment. Yeah. Um, and you know, this it it strikes me that one of the one of the uh, conditions for actually asking those questions is. Um, is conversation between art historians, conservators, conservation scientists. Um, so to you know to create a space and a, and a language in which those conservation uh, cons um, conversations can happen, yes, um, yes. and a kind of alignment of the kinds of questions that are being asked. I see. And some in that sense, it's you know the ideal place that these conversations can take place is within a museum yes. with its own specific laboratory because there. The scientist is on the spot, not up the road or even further afield in a university or research institute. And that makes it more difficult to have these conversations bubbling up um, yeah. just for, on, on the basis of a, a daily practice. Great. I, I, I see some questions, some virtual hands raised. Ali, and please um, do be careful as you drive. Both actual hands on the wheel, I assume. Right, no, yeah, I, I, I'm giving a bad example to my students. I'm sorry, I, I, um, and I should never be doing this, but I, I'm, I'm in my neighborhood and I'm just almost done, so. Um, but uh, Dr. Tennant, thank you so much uh, for a wonderful talk. I, I did it in the middle of my morning exercise routine and, and I was just enthralled throughout the entire talk and I've been waiting for it for a long time. Um, my, my question was more on the, the, the um, um, the analyst, uh, an analysis of sort of cobalt uh, ores and, and sort of finding the regionalization of the different mines um, that they might originate from. Yeah. Uh, and I guess, I guess what I wanted to ask was that how far can we take the hyper regionalization of, of a certain cobalt source in, when, we, when we just have the object? And the reason I ask is, I'm thinking of my own process of, of, of working backwards from the text. And uh, when you have a certain text uh, with a recipe for a certain glaze that brings out a blue, uh, I guess in the discussion of blue and whites, um, how would you, I mean, how, uh, often these authors only will name one location of where cobalt is sourced from. Um, and so, and I've always wondered I'm, I, that um, I'm pretty sure that they're getting different uh, sources in the market um, at the time to, to sort of produce their glazes. So is there a yeah. way to, to sort of an, analyze the, the ores to sort of see if, I mean, I know that you mentioned, okay, we can find out if they're coming from Germany or Afghanistan, but can we even hyper-regionalize it in some ways to say it's from this specific mine or this specific region? Uh, yes, in, well, I mean, I understand exactly your question as to how specific can we be essentially as to the source. Uh, I think the, the point is certainly that there is pretty reliable documentation about certain main sources of ores. And that's a starting point. But of course, it could be that there are other locations that have that were used and have similar or different signatures and how does one find it? Well, of course, that's where the research is um, really difficult. I think I could maybe use not the cobalt ore situation, but the source of lead and lead isotope analysis. Uh, and there's been an immense amount of analysis of sources of lead uh, to find the isotope ratio and therefore the signature of all those geological sources. So there, there is a, you know, a map of that information that has built up by study and further study and further study. Uh, that's difficult to do. If I was talking about sources of ores from Afghanistan, that's particularly difficult to do at the present time, for example. So it's a, it's a question that's not really going to have a full answer. And I think the, the starting point is to at least build up the knowledge. And th this is what's happened um, by workers in this particular topic, not myself, I may ask, and, um, who have actually said, well, we can take the documentary evidence of what mines existed in historical times and what was used. And we can at least research that expanding upon that to say were there other ones well that's tricky but i think my my sensation is that 
if there were significant sources used, they would have been put into some documentary evidence that should be currently available. That's maybe for you to, to tell me, am I right? <laughs> I, I mean, I'm just, I assume that um, often the, the authors of these, of these recipes, like they're, they're, they're also following a convention that this is the area where it's mined from. Uh, but then we, we think about consumerism and, and the medieval period, I guess, per se, is that, um, you know, they're, they're selling it in the market, but I, I just, I assume that uh, it, I, I just assume that there's multiple, and, and, and the way I'm thinking about this is mainly through uh, uh, numismatics, actually, rather than ceramics. But like we 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 know that different coins come from different mints, uh, not different, sorry, different mines. When we when we sort of analyze the metal to sort of see where people are sourcing it from, and and that really helps in understanding how dynasties kind of expand uh, and and where they're putting their effort to. Uh, to protect their borders because they want to keep certain mines uh, in, inside their inside their um, uh, territory. So I'm I, I'm trying to apply this sort of same uh, model, but to understanding kind of that uh, that there has to have been different sources and different mines, and and I just wonder if if the end product uh, of 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 the ceramic itself and and through the analysis does that can that point us to the direction of of, of different uh, sort of as the word that you use is signature, which I think is awesome uh, uh, to, to sort of understand the, the origins of, of where these things are coming into the market from. But yeah, and I, I think yeah, you answered well, that. I, I mean, I think it, it's obviously like all these subjects, something that the more information you have, the more specificity you will be able to, to have. Right. I would say that at the present, we have information of sources of minerals from recognized recognized um, documentary evidence that they were used and so it is possible to say that this ceramic was not using Persian uh, cobalt in so far as it corresponds to no Persian source that we know at the present that's the, the, the proviso. Likewise, it seems to be consistent with Afghanistan like cobalt Thank you. because it matches that particular source. So that's not proof positive, but it gives you a discrimination which is quite reliable, I think. Um, and yes, we, uh, you know, in my own studies, we did look at a smalt, which is the cobalt pigment for that was used in painting for a lot of um, um, and still is uh, and we wondered if Chinese small was uh, using um, ores from China uh, and a contemporaneous European easel painting was using sources from Germany and in fact the Chinese material was uh, the same signature as the um, as the European paintings so that's very interesting indeed. Uh, I think there's a lot we have still to learn about trade routes and, uh, and we, one tends to think that it comes from the more exotic areas to the European areas, but it might have actually gone the other way around as well. This is amazing. Thank you so much. It's just opened we, up. We, so should, we, should, we, should, uh, we should Zoom one-on-one -on -one soon, I think. Definitely, yes. Yeah, I know we've, we've planned it a while back, but... Yeah, we, let, let's, let's, let's do it. It's nice to meet right, you now. Right, yeah. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Sarah, have we got your other view? Yes, I'm, I'm back. I was just signed out again. Um, I'm sorry for that. And I've, I've stopped my video. Hopefully that will, um, that will uh, uh, yeah, yeah, preserve yeah. bandwidth. But this is um, a perfect example of the ways in which, um, you know, research on the technical side, as well as on the art historical side, involving both objects themselves and, um, and primary documents. And primary documents of, of you know a range of types, whether they're workshop manuals or mercantile handbooks, um, uh, you know that it, it becomes a question of aggregating and 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 uh, cross referencing those those sources. And I'm just kind of adding in here to to confirm that even further, Sarah. Um, 
the location I know very well is research in the Netherlands. And there for easel painting, there's an immense amount of workshop practice, um, manuals, the Mayern, and all, all these particular early documentations, which are now being studied and very much the recipes repeated because a recipe in its own right doesn't tell you anything until you actually see what does it give and can we analyze that and can we actually then relate that to what we see on objects so that's a very Lauren, I see a question from <laughs> oh sorry I didn't mean to <laughs> yes hello hello apologies again apologies again Lauren please um take take the the stage yeah, no problem. Um, firstly, thank you, Dr. Tennant. I really enjoyed that talk. And good to see you. Good, good to see you again. It's <laughs> yep. uh, it a while since so we chatted. It's nice to see you. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, I kind of had my question is kind of related to Dr. Alibi's actually. Because um, I can imagine how conservation scientists and conservators are working together, like in the more hands on analysis of an object. But, like, what did the collaborations with art historians look like? Like, are you the one searching through the primary documents, or do you usually piggyback off of? Um, they're more theoretical. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's difficult to, for me to be too categorical about that because I must admit that my more frequent collaborators are conservators rather than art historians. So I'm not talking from a position of a great experience uh, in uh, representing how it works in general. I think you know, the, what, what is certain, Lauren, I think, is that the art historical world is becoming much more aware of what science can do and, uh, and the, the role it plays. And therefore, the art historian is therefore much more capable of formulating questions in a, in, of the sort that scientists can then take further forward because they know the potentiality of the science, which is a little bit related to what I was saying earlier, that uh, the, the solving of a, of a question, the answering of a question is related to uh, how doable it is um, with the state of science knowledge. Uh, I think uh, it, it will vary. Um, the, you know, the, the, like all fields, there are those art historians who are very much coming to the scientist um, with a question. Let me maybe just answer it in one sense with a specific topic that I'm about to um, uh, put, well, I don't know if I'm about to, but I would like to embark upon. The, the, it's again a ceramic question, but I think it, it makes an interesting point. I have heard from art historians that there is a big question about the group of Chinese ceramics, which is called Fami Noir. And that is with a very black background and in reserved areas, you get floral designs and so on. But the general background is black. And the question is, and in fact, who's for her? I, I don't know, are you still here? I think you are, uh, I see your face at least. Um, this was a, a little bit studied in uh, a, a, a master's project that Hus Farhar, who's now doing the glass work, embarked upon to analyze some of these objects. Because the big art historical question, so this comes from the art historian, is what objects come from the very early period of this particular type of famille noir ceramic and have some of the objects that have been designated as earlier ones actually are they from a century or so later so that would actually require authentic objects of the right period of which there are a handful uh, in the collection in Dresden of Augustus, uh, Augustus the Strong uh, and they are documented, we're back to documentation, that they were in his collection in the right time. So the, the, the documentation and the objects go together and now we need an, an analysis to see if there is a particular signature that goes with those black, or black glazes as opposed to the uh, uh, other ones. That would be easy to do. I don't know if it has been done yet, but I do know that when I was in Beijing, I found another um, link in the chain 
which is that I, as a scientist, knowing this art historical question, therefore was able to probe at the Palace Museum in the Forbidden City, what do you know about this? They didn't, the scientists didn't know the art historian's question, but they said, oh, well, we've got an analysis of, the, of this very early type, and we can tell you exactly what the glaze contains. But they didn't know that it was an issue of attribution in European museums to see if their pieces were early or late. So it's a case, uh, another case of communication and making sure that the, the two sides talk together. It's not an answer to your question, but it's, it, it shows you your question is a good one and one can come at it from different directions. I hope that helps a little bit. Yeah, no, thank you. It's interesting to think about the fluidity of like, you have to worry about like distant geographies and like different disciplines, like there's a lot. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, all that, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. And we should have, uh, we should have, uh, this is the, the thing, the, the, the bottom line of the, this, this seminar is, we should have a little Zoom sometime soon as well. Shall we do that? Ah, that'd be lovely. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you. It seems like Sarah's coming in and out, so I wanted to check with anybody. Did anybody else have any further questions for Norman? Thank you for stepping in, Katrina. I'm not sure, you know, two years into the pandemic, you would think that I would have this Zoom thing down, um, or my computer would at least. Um, if there no other questions and I just I'm not sure how um, Norman ended his commentary um, because I was I was cut off but you know this question of, of the 18th and 19th century um, with porcelain is so interesting also from a geographic point of view because you know the the um, uh, the experimentation and production in Dresden is then of course um, you know moving to Naples and and on to Spain as through these kind of court um, court centers for the production of, of porcelain. Um, so, uh, you know, again, it, it, it emphasizes that point of, for, of working together to formulate questions and then to, um, and then to devise approaches to uh, addressing them. Any other questions I would invite? If not, thank you all for joining us and thank you, Norman, for, for being with us and, and for for, uh, giving us this time. My pleasure, indeed. And uh, if if you if it's of any relevance, um, I don't know if you still have that article, but maybe for your master's people, that article where I discuss science from the uh, the four perspectives. Would you want me to maybe send you the PDF again, Sarah, for that? that you know, I'm almost sure that I have it, but if you would send it yeah. to me then, it will be right at the top of my inbox. And right. I know okay. that my it might just be a, a, a good follow up. That they, Wonderful. They, since, I, since I mentioned it, that they at least have it for reference. That would be nice. Wonderful. I will pass it on to my students and to everyone who attended today. Okay. Well, thank you all. And thank you, Norman. And, uh, and goodbye and be well. Yeah, and thank you for doing such a wonderful, charming job as uh, my uh, host in Dallas. <laughs> thank <laughs> Despite you. Despite the technical bug yes. bugs, <laughs> we're all subject to those. That's for I sure. know, I know, unavoidable. Thank okay. you so much.